London, Copenhagen, Toronto. You'll hear conversations from those cities and elsewhere in Notebook on Cities and Culture's fourth season. If that is, we raise the funds on Kickstarter. The drive begins on Monday, June 17th. For details, stay tuned to colinmarshall.org. Thanks. Season 3 of Notebook on Cities and Culture is brought to you by Carl Haley and Daniel Murphy. It surprised me when I found out that Vancouverism, the term, had a whole Wikipedia page and a robust one. Uh, but listeners can pull it up if they want. I want to know from you, what is your personal definition of Vancouverism? What is it to you? Well, oh boy, you know, you push that little button, <laughs> we can get right down into the weeds. Sometimes it's really an architectural way of saying this particular form has evolved, but certainly has been built in a significant amount in the central area of Vancouver. These point towers, small floor plates, buildings around 20 to 30 stories, thin towers with podiums evolved out of the 1990s, some antecedents. Often that's what's called Vancouverism, but more importantly, it really is the mix of uses, sufficient densities that allow different transportation choices to be practical. So the car starts dropping out as the dominant mode. And then a real emphasis on the public space, urban design, spaces in between. There's a dichotomy in this city. I wouldn't call it a schizophrenia, but it's not very far below the surface when you realize the contradiction of this place. We're here because we're part of a global trading system that moves vast commodities from half a continent, makes us rich and allows people to come here from all over the world and find their place in it. And then they become oh, captured by the beauty of it. And it's almost a sense of uh, Eden-like quality to it. That's part of the tradition of Los Angeles and San Francisco, too. And indeed, Portland and Seattle, all up and down the West Coast. And so you get, on one hand, a desire to save nature, to preserve it, to keep the purity of this kind of Eden. While at the same time, we make our money and we're in business because we cream off nature's bounty and ship it somewhere else. We're engaged in that discussion right now. Pipelines, coal ports, uh, liquefied natural gas, you know, billions of dollars of revenue that will allow a prosperous place like this to survive. Fund those kind of social programs that define the Canadian identity and do great city building. While at the same time, we try and keep a sense of, uh, as they say, almost in Eden, uh, Stanley Park. The North Shore Mountains, the way of life, uh, the outdoor quality to this, the environmental movement, the origins of Greenpeace. It's a really interesting dynamic. And while one voice may be stronger at one time, neither can dominate. Mm-hmm. you got to make money, but what do you use your money for? What's your quality of life? What can you afford? What does government do? What's its role? Uh, and how do we fit into, again, these lar- larger global forces? Well, out of that, Vancouverism kind of has produced a certain architectural model that allows livable density for a range of social classes and incomes. That's a really important part that doesn't get talked about it. People say this is an unaffordable place, and yet, in the downtown peninsula, there are tens of thousands of lower middle income renters. And that's a product of doing Vancouverism 1.0, rental high-rises from the 1960s. Now we build glass, green glass towers for condominiums. Some of it goes on to the international real estate market. Some of it may be considered unaffordable, but there are still places there for a range of incomes, different kinds of occupations, but still the dominant mode for people moving through this landscape, this built city, is foot. And the public spaces, clean, green, and safe. That's kind of the fundamental responsibility of the civic government, clean, green, and safe give opportunity to people uh, to invent themselves. They come from so many different places here. Everybody now is a visible minority and creates the ambience for which we try and put a name on it. Vancouverism, as you can see, means a lot of different things. It is Notebook on Cities and Culture. I'm Colin Marshall, coming to you from above Hastings Street here in Vancouver, British Columbia, with Gordon Price, who directs the city program at Simon Simon Fraser, University, who speaks, consults, and teaches on the subjects of urban planning and development, who puts out an electronic magazine called Price Tags, who has been the councillor of the city of Vancouver, who has sat on transit boards, who is the right person to ask, clearly, about Vancouverism. Density. Speaking of density, I keep hearing that... D-word. Yes, the D-word. I've heard something that seems to me slightly implausible, 
with the West End supposedly had the highest density in North America or has uh, Mexico City comes to mind. I was just there. Uh, would, would you, is that true? That's, that's Can that be true? A, yeah, no. Okay. <laughs> it never was. Why do they say Not it? You've, you've certainly heard this thrown yeah. around. Because you can see high rises across water. Oh, sure. The impact's very visible. And it was a shock. It happened in 1956, uh, the council of that time, and I'm sure they had no idea what they were doing. It just seemed like a good idea. Let me actually start with the most important thing that never happened to Vancouver, for which it is not possible to understand this place. We're one of the only large-sized Canadian cities that did not build freeways into its downtown core. We're fully expecting to. The plans were almost complete. And then for a variety of reasons, funding primarily, but also a very broad base, uh, really a coalition, from Chinese businessmen to UBC academics, labor, even eventually the business community, thought, mm, not such a great idea. So no question we would have if we'd had the money, but we didn't, so we couldn't. And as a consequence, we have the legacy of the first surveys, the grids, rationalized, interestingly, by Harlan Bartholomew, the most important arguably 20th century planner that no one knows about, did the 1923 major traffic street plan in Los Angeles and basically did a version of it here, a rationalization of the grid, still intending to keep transit, and a combination that has served us remarkably well because we didn't literally bulldoze it aside to build the freeways. And as a result, and here's the connection, the Community, and I think I mean everyone from the developers and the politicians right down to those who moved here or lived here, had to come to terms with doing density well. Our boundaries are so defined by nature. It's water. It's mountains. You don't get to argue with that. And once we had built out all of the available greenfield sites, reached that point in the downtown peninsula by about the turn of the 20th century in the 1900s, the city as a whole, our 44 square miles, by the 1970s, we had only one choice. Well, we had two choices. You can take the existing housing stock and you can just start dividing it up. It becomes ever more crowded and usually it goes into decline. And there's 20th century patterns of that. It's the kind of stuff that Jane Jacobs noted as being overcrowded, which is a whole different thing than high density. And what Vancouver undertook, starting in 1956, was doing high density in a livable way. Now, at that time, because the high-rises were for rental stock, it was just basically the boom-boom growth real estate machine. But it did provide tens of thousands of units right next to our parks and beaches close to downtown along the old streetcar routes that by now are converted to electric trolley bus. But it was a whole new way of building. It was high-rises. It was concrete. It was modernism. And it was a shock to the system. But it was done so quickly. There are hundreds of these buildings in the West End in that square mile. And they were all pretty much done within about a 10-year period. So it was uh, uh, the kind of growth that transforms a place and does produce a shock to the system. Right. And so in 1972, when the council changed, it was no longer so development-oriented, they started downzoning all of these old inner-city streetcar neighborhoods, preserving our heritage, or at least stopping that growth machine. And they left this legacy of these towers in the West End. They were the bad example. They were what everybody pointed to as not wanting anything near them. And wow. This is the growth of nimbyism and this, this, re this a belief, anyway, that height equaled density, and density led to social decay. And there were lots of examples that we could point to in the United States because the high-rise form was almost solely associated with urban renewal, public housing, and eventually all the problems that were manifest in the American city in the 1960s. By the demolition of pruitt Igo, famously, that was the end of modernism. That was the end of the least discrediting of the high-rise, the association with it of poverty and decay. And so people kind of thought that that's what had happened to the West End not recognizing that, in fact, it had been built by the private sector, that it had fitted into this old grid. It wasn't super block. It wasn't massive urban renewal. It was really taking little bits and pieces and building, slipping in these high-rises and providing really good quality accommodation for middle-income renters. Very different social animal. And what I've learned, <laughs> both in politics and life, is let things age in place. If they are fundamentally viable, and they have the right kind of social supports, and the economy is reasonably good, healing will take place. 
And that which people will reject initially because of the shock of the new, within a generation will become heritage. They all want to slap a plaque on it and preserve it. And that's exactly what's happened. People propose infill now on some of the parking lots of these old high-rises. And people will come and say, you're destroying the modernist purity of them. By, by destroying the parking lots? Yeah. Hmm. Because that's what separates the towers. Basically, they're anxious about infill, of increase in density, even though they're living very happily within it. Right. And there's, there's some law about that where you can't build towers more than a certain number of... Well, it's not exact. We do a lot of things here by guidelines. I see. Yeah, but people then say, oh, well, that's what's required. Well, the city has a lot of power, and it's discretionary. The Council of 72 brought in this idea of discretionary zoning. So you have an outright, say, 1.5 FSR if you're FAR, plot ratio, different name, same thing. Uh, the density is determined by the size of the lot and then the amount of billable square feet. Am I getting too into the weeds on this? That's fine. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, we had a small densities and small lots. Mm-hmm. Here's my recommended reading for your listeners. There's a book called Measuring America. Mm-hmm. And if you think surveying is dull, that will change your mind. And you won't understand America or a good part of Canada without knowing how it was laid out um, up through the Northwest Ordinances on the chain, mm-hmm. which gets us to Vancouver, 66-foot rights of way, 33-foot lots going back to lanes in the back. That pattern really allowed the dense, the gentle densification of the city. But to get back to your question, why do people think it's the densest? Yes. Well, because it happened so fast. It was a shock of the new. Because it was high, they associated that with density. Because you could see it from across water. So it was there, it was the concrete wall, the concrete jungle. It just seemed like it should be. Mm. Not even close. In Montreal, in Outremont, two and a half times the size of the West End, townhousing, row housing, um, broken up into suites, Mm -hmm. two and a half times the size of the West End and almost double the density. Mm -hmm. For those who know Toronto, St. Jamestown, you merely need to see it and you'll realize Vancouver doesn't even approach those kind of densities. Mm -hmm. But take Manhattan. You can simply take all of the population on that island, divide by its area, just do a crude measure and you can see that, again, the West End never even approached it. But the mythology is popular, I think, because people, if they believe that density is a problem, is density leads to social decay, that density is inherently problematic at best, generates traffic, uh, rats in concrete boxes and mazes. I mean, all of those were popular associations at the time. Mm-hmm. Miss Jane Jacobs' essential point, which is that People want to get out of overcrowding, which is too many people in too small a space. Mm -hmm. But some of them may well search out a high-density neighborhood because it offers them diversity, Mm -hmm. choice, housing style appropriate to their income or to their desires. It may be a social uh, construct. Uh, The movement of young people back into the city is a current phenomenon. The gays did that back in the 1960s and 70s. They searched out these neighborhoods close to city, good transit, uh, socially diverse or at least possible to invent your own lifestyle, but typically within the heart of the city. And so the West End was just a perfect environment for that in the 1960s and 70s. Mm-hmm. In an ecology with seniors, people who didn't have children, maybe young couples just starting out, areas of transition, people moving to the city, maybe divorced, reinventing themselves. Mm-hmm. Cities need places like this. And if you can combine them, with livable density and transportation choice, with the kind of public amenities and the opportunities, you're creating incredibly dynamic places. And human beings have been doing this ever since there have been cities. What Vancouver came up with mid-20th century was a viable model using the high-rise form that really worked. And even though for a period of about 10 to 20 years we didn't do it, we came back again in the 90s to accommodate growth. Now for condominiums, that is, you could buy those little concrete boxes in the sky, with people coming from particularly Asia and these old industrial sites, particularly along water, railroad yards, do blank um, play, blank page planning. In other words, one big parcel that could be comprehensively planned, required no demolition, didn't have to evict people. In other words, community willing to accept it. And because it was along water, you can hardly go wrong. You really have to go a long way to screw up an opportunity to build along water. Right? And they only come along every so often, brownfield sites. You can see the change in New York along the Hudson River. Now, I mean, Los Angeles has an amazing opportunity along the Los Angeles River. They're just starting to explore. 
prediction. I hope I live long enough to see it. But the Los well, Angeles with Los Angeles stuff, I hope I live long enough to see some of these things. You know, they push them out twenty fifty, twenty sixty. You know well, what I mean? Maybe so. But Measure R and the building of transit now on the scale that you are building is already becoming transformative. Mm-hmm. Combine it with the Los Angeles River greenways, the car starting to drop out as the dominant mode, and it will in some neighborhoods. As hard as people is, I would say Los Angeles is likely to be one of the places where it will be most noted because it will be most surprising to people. I say this on the show a lot, but I don't have one. So maybe I'm an example. Living proof. Yeah, well, you can in Koreatown, in West Hollywood, around UCLA, in parts of Culver City, Right, wherever these transit lines are going to go, and you've got your dingbat apartments, yes, you do. the density is already there. Mm-hmm. And the old streetcar lines, the Santa Monica Boulevards, the Melroses, the La Cienegas, they're all there. The texture is all there. Mm-hmm. What you're going to do, this is my prediction about Los, West Los Angeles, that is from downtown to Santa Monica, from the Hollywood Hills to, um, yeah, uh, keep forgetting the name of the hills in the south. But we, 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 know, we, we know what you mean, yeah. Uh, fabulous view. Yeah. You see it in modern family all the time. They'll use that view back across. <laughs> well, I, you know, I was on that view, and a good friend who lives up in um, Ladera Heights, mm. and realized, looking across on a clear day, and you got more of them than people will acknowledge, yeah. the Hollywood Hills, well, they were like just there. It was an yeah. easy cycle. And so, you know, thank you, Google Earth. I could go back and realize it's only five miles away. You're only five miles across the Los Angeles basin there. Um, And then from downtown Los Angeles to Santa Monica, it's about the distance from Point Grey, the 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 westernmost point in Vancouver, to Burnaby, our adjacent municipality. It's like a 14, 15-mile distance. Yeah, about 14 to 15 miles by five miles. With this fabric, like Vancouver, left over from the electric streetcar, higher densities than people think, pretty good mix of land uses, and, of course, an incredible cultural vitality. What's not to like? The problem with Los Angeles was simply that it tried to build solely for the car. And for, you know, a good part of its post-war history, that kind of worked. You could get around the city reasonably efficiently using the freeway and the major arterials. Right. That did reasonably work until it didn't. <laughs> yes. Right? When did people realize it didn't work? And I mean across North America. Uh, when the freeway system to be completed had to move through high affluent and powerful areas. Mm. So you don't see a freeway through, say, the northwest quadrant of Washington, D.C. You don't see it through Pacific Heights. I mean, the plans are all there. You don't see it through the affluent neighborhoods of Vancouver, and you won't. You won't see it. Now, the the freeway builders, it's a great story, too. It's certainly worth knowing more generally about how the interstate freeway system got built, the unleashing of the resources to build the world's greatest public works project, how quickly it was done, transformed a continent. You can go coast to coast, border to border, many times over on this great continental freeway grid, which, by the way, ends at 70th and Oak. By the time you get to the first intersection stoplight coming into the city of Vancouver from the south, the previous one would have been Tijuana, Mexico. (laughs) It's an astonishing achievement because it goes around cities. It crosses regions. It's an essential part for the goods movement uh, port cities like Los Angeles. And if it had solely come into the city and then allowed this combination of uses based upon the streetcar, the foot, the bicycle, the car, but only appropriately when it works well, mm-hmm. that, that could have worked out pretty well. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, Los Angeles went the next step, and it took its great arterial streets, Wilshire in particular, and Santa Monica and all the others that are familiar to people. Mm-hmm. They all come freighted with historical reference, yes. and they made them what Charles Marone calls strodes, mm-hmm. the worst combination of street and road. <laughs> strodes. Yeah. <laughs> As streetcar villages, they work great, mm-hmm. but they have to be predominantly pedestrian. You can get to it by car and transit, but you associate the movement uh, through the village by foot. No, they wanted to make them basically high-capacity corridors, and they did. Mm. Take La Cienega. It's one street that I find most curious. It goes through some of the most expensive real estate in the world. Mm. Beverly Hills on one side, West L.A. on the other. And for a good part of it, it's crap. (laughs) Yes. Now, that's Charles Marone's point. Strong Towns out of of Minnesota would recommend his work in an interview. says the unrealized values there are staggering. Mm. We can't afford to waste land like that. And from a development opportunity to build a mix of both retail and residential using a variety of different forms, high-rise can be one, 
Century City is kind of an attempt to do it, but not well, no. right? You've got to go back to this integrated fabric mm-hmm. that has to serve as a street, get you across the region, and that's why the freeway allows for those who really need to do it to keep off of these streets that then allow transit to dominate, room for the bicycle, friendly for the foot. You put that mixed together, people love this stuff. You'll find within a generation the problem will become from something that was associated, say, with lower middle income renters, will be too expensive for them. Mm-hmm. Gentrification. It's a nice problem to have. I'm sure you're seeing it in Koreatown. Right. More, yeah. more, more downtown, but Koreatown, yes, as well. Yeah. You'll see it anywhere mm-hmm. where the system goes. Once the transit system is its own grid, its own interconnected, its own network mm-hmm. that's seamless with all of these other modes. You can separate land use and transportation. We do, of course. We fund them differently. We argue about them differently. We think about them differently, but you can't separate them. It's a divorce that can never be broken. Technology, like the streetcar, like the freeway, generated its own urban forms. The real estate opportunities, the densities, and it's all its varying range. Well, we're simply discovering now, after about half a century that you've got to have a mix and they have to be integrated into networks that are seamlessly connected. New technologies allow us to do it. New confidence in urban design and form. New real estate opportunities. It's developers in Vancouver that are getting behind transit. They recognize there will never be new roads built in this city. In fact, the councils from the 1970s, including the one I was on, had as a matter of public policy, there will be no expansion of the road system for the single occupancy vehicle. And once you tell engineers that, and you follow it up with budgets, budgets are the sincerest form of rhetoric. If you give them money to keep building roads, they'll find ways to do it. If you give them money to, say, the engineers who are planning separated bikeways, public spaces, Mm -hmm. but still have responsibility for transportation, New York, obviously, look at what Jeanette Sadek Khan is doing. Mm -hmm. Who would have believed Broadway would be taken out of the road grid through Times Square, right? Mm -hmm. And now look at the economic... Uh, generator that that's produced in terms of new markets, new customers, new sense of space. You can combine public goals, good public spaces, with private ones, wealth, making money, jobs, with a transportation system that serves multiple needs through multiple sources of funding so that one needn't be antagonistic to the other, but you can't let the car dominate. Car doesn't disappear, and nor would you want it to. Uh, car sharing, for instance, illustrates the need to have access to the car trip. Uh, taxis. Uh, there'll be all kinds of things. Electric assist uh, bicycles and scooters, and who thinks we can't even imagine. All connected by the opportunity to move safely, greenly, if you wish, by foot. We will love this stuff. And then you can fit the suburbs into that. That's why I think Los Angeles is going to be a particularly intriguing model. You wouldn't want to go in and transform some of those suburbs. They are terrific. Those bungalow suburbs that characterize the era of L.A. from the 1880s through to the 1920s, best stuff ever built, still hallowed right, in memory, and the reality of it's still just absolutely beautiful. You can take those forms and perfectly well integrate them into high-rise communities in Hollywood, for instance, is experimenting with us now, have good debates over scale, urban form, Mm -hmm. architecture, but the fundamentals, and I think this is the real lesson from Vancouver, is sufficient densities, bit of a weasel word there, sufficient, Mm -hmm. right? But it's not the same thing as overcrowding. Mm -hmm. Do it in a way that's livable Mm -hmm. and creates the densities that are sufficient to support retail in its varied forms. You have to tame the box. Mm -hmm. You've got to get those Costco's and those big boxes into this fabric, and that can be done. Vancouver has models of that now. You've got to have varying forms of housing, a real mix of different sizes and wealth and opportunities, transitional, uh, the dynamic of the city. And again, Los Angeles, don't have to tell you. You've already got it. (laughs) More of that. And then transportation choice pops up. People start just making practical decisions. You're not guilting them out. You're not doing it for environmental reasons. You're not doing it because it's your only choice. You're making choices that work for you. So two kilometers, a mile. You might as well walk. Right. Okay? Or maybe once it gets between about one mile and five miles, cycle. Right. Is it safe? Is it practical? Are the routes separated? Do you feel comfortable? Can you take your kid? Can you take your eight-year-old? Can the 80-year-old do it? Once you get to that stage then, and you have to have, again, a connected grid for this, it's doable. Mm. You've got another choice. 
which then takes pressure off of your road system. You don't need as much space for cars. Maybe you need it for a BRT system, right? right? Surface, maybe you need it for light rail. Again, another choice. One way of pain, whether it's the taxi, whether it's all forms of transit, maybe it's for bike share. Just a story the other day of how a bike system that was bike share system that was failing now is doing better because you can use your go-kart that you use for transit to get a bike. Again, it's using the technology to do what you can do physically with these grids, these layers, these networks of transportation. Vancouver, if you want to see what that looks like, is a place you can walk around. So while I may proselytize about it, and you can have a good theoretical discussion about its origins, there's no ambiguity. You can go and walk around in it. You can take the bus or the trolley or the SkyTrain. You can cycle on the separated routes. You can see what a bikeway network looks like. You can experience the city in levels of detail. So, yeah, we've had our moment. We've had the 90s and the 2000s to take advantage of the immigration, the real estate opportunities, these brownfield sites with a particular form of governance, a sophisticated development community, architects and landscape architects and engineers who work together. That's really key, too. you got to get your planners and your engineers working together, and they can. They will. There's a new generation coming up, new technologies that offer it, new economic opportunities, and uh, in the end, I suppose, just an absolute necessity. Mm-hmm. We can now move nicely into issues around carbon and climate change and sustainability because those ones are just ticking away. (laughs) And if my generation, the boomers, don't get out of the way and let the next generation of decision makers address these problems seriously, everything that we've done will be pretty meaningless. Mm. The city does offer some hope for a more sustainable way of life. But it has to meet all of these other criteria. It's got to be livable. It must be appropriate for all different kinds of people. It has to generate choices. It has to work practically. It has to be affordable. Uh, And it's doable. Mm -hmm. One big message, because it's a really good news one. You try this stuff out, give Jane Jacobs some credit for it, combined with the forces of technology and growth, you put those together it works. It works. We've got we've got some positive examples. So no matter how bleak things may look when you're dealing with the politics of your time, and hey, God knows, L.A., <laughs> at the same time, you've got some really interesting working examples. You're moving forward in some significant ways. And when I look at it, I say, ah, it's the Vancouver of 2020, yes. maybe 2030. But it's on its way. Right. Sooner, <laughs> sooner or later, you know, for better or for worse, I suppose worse, the freeways have become the icons of Los Angeles. And for better or for worse, seemingly on the better side, the condo towers have become the icons of 21st century Vancouver. And I wonder, this is kind of a murmur I hear among people who, who I know who live here. Do you, do you wonder if there's a risk of Vancouverites growing weary of all the condo towers? Uh, sure, uh, green glass. Of, of, and of, of some, some fear that... The streets are going to be walkable, but am I going to walk between fortress-like condo tower and fortress-like condo tower? You know. Well, when was that not true? Mm. Name me an apartment building that, by that definition, isn't a fortress. Oh, okay. The, the corridors aren't public spaces. Mm. You have to have a key. Mm. Yes, <laughs> and usually one of those key fobs I've noticed. Yes, uh, they exactly. borrowed one from a yes, friend. That's, that's, that's they don't have those in Los Angeles yeah. usually. Well, <laughs> yes, one day, one day. Yeah. Well, no. I yeah. No. I look. That's um, the same. Thing as I guess uh, the um, the Brits in the 1920s had about Victorian architecture, mm-hmm. they found it quite dreadful. Mm-hmm. Started to tear down very large amounts of it. The next generation after that then took another look at it, and this, we're going to go through the same cycle here as you will go through with your freeways. Mm-hmm. Uh, absolutely confidently predict that the freeway, because it's so iconic, will there will be fights to preserve its, uh, its aesthetics, its integrity, mm-hmm. its beauty, its functionalism, its mm-hmm. A heritage role in the development of the city. Right. It's the cycle. That which we had contempt for uh, from the previous generation because we we're reacting against it will be the heritage movement's next battle to save. Mm. And uh, because it does do some really important functional things and because you've learned to live with it, it literally has grown. You know, the landscaping has come in and kind of taken it over. Yeah. Uh, again, you know, there are parts of it that can be done better and there are challenges like the Los Angeles River. I mean, there is a really interesting example of taking the hydraulics. Uh, you've got to do that with that river, right? You get these uh, massive amounts of water. Yes. 
All right, but you can already see in places like Frogtown. Right. That's a, I rarely hear Frogtown mentioned outside Los Angeles, but clearly you're savvy. Cyclists took me to it, oh, I and see. I right away realized how significant this was mm. and how the people who are living there now in Frogtown are really going to be subject to some pretty powerful forces of gentrification eventually. Mm. That's why from a public policy point of view, you want to identify where the future is and make your housing investments right. uh, now so that you maintain a mix over time. We have a huge debate over here about the downtown east side. Mm. Porous postal code in Canada it said stock stark poverty and dysfunction and drugs and prostitution right next to these condo towers. And there's a huge frictional debate about it. From my point of view, there's an investment of seven thousand dedicated units of non market housing. They will never be changed. They mm. will always be for those people who have no other market choice. Mm. There's another uh, 4,000 units that we can at least try and stabilize. That's half the housing stock of the West End. Mm. So you make those commitments early on when you can afford it because you're realizing that cities are organic, that no matter how far down they get, and I saw New York in the 70s. Oh, yes. I yes, saw yes, yes. <laughs> so Some of the Vancouverites I've been interviewing have, you know, they, they happen to have been exposed to Vancouver at or near the bottom, Vancouver, New York at or near the bottom, and that only... The contrast can only benefit Vancouver, I would imagine. Well, it did at the time, but at the same time, when I was going there uh, in the late 70s from the West End, I just moved here in 78, and was very much of the opinion that density and certainly the way we did it in the West End was just about the nadir, certainly of architectural design. and was going to lead to social problems, which for a lot of people thought the gay community, the emergence of street prostitution was very much validation of that. Mm. And if you go to a place like New York, you could certainly make the case that, my God, this uh, overbuilding, uh, as I learned later, consequences of Robert Moses' intervention may, because of the power broker overstate that, but okay. You could certainly make any case you wanted that New York was an incredible failure and was just going to continue to go down the tubes. So people would dance on the edge of it, uh, you know, that cultural vitality of the time that people kind of look nostalgically at now. No one would have believed that New York would come back. Mm -hmm. And not just because of Giuliani, who too much gets the credit. It was because of the housing investment Mm -hmm. under Koch, the uh, emergence of all of these agencies and interventions like the Nehemiah Project in places like the South Bronx. wasn't apparent at the time. It was the policing strategies under Dinkins, the money flowing from the federal government to basically hire an army, which is what they did, But it was also all of the other social inventions that occurred, whether it was the gay men's health crisis in response to the AIDS epidemic, it was people pioneering. Oh, I mean, all the reasons you can think of. The financial district, a viable economy, all of these reasons. How Look how fast that changed. So no matter uh, if you had seen... Los Angeles had any of the number of riots and thinking this place has no future. Never, never right off a well located geographically strategic port city with huge cultural uh, capital in a good climate where people have the opportunity to not only reinvent themselves but reinvent their neighborhoods and ultimately the city. Always, it's so organic, always reinventing themselves. Needs leadership, strong political direction, community support, an alliance of business with other wealth creators, unions, working people, uh, and of course... For the next generation, people from all over the world, brown people, black people, white people, everyone's going to be a visible majority, a minority in our cities. That's already a done deal. And that, again, just leads to these amazing new opportunities and new sources of friction. So there ain't any utopia that's going to be constructed out of places like this. But uh, given the underlying legacy of a very effective way of building out a city, and now the new investments, particularly in forms of transportation that will give you more choice and sufficient densities and good mixes. Hey, what's not to like? Mm. I would say the focus, as I can see it more and more in places like Los Angeles, is solving that other problem of the green and the clean and the attractive, making places beautiful and functional and safe. Mariachi Plaza yeah. on the gold line. Uh, did a tour with Spur out of San Francisco, and uh, uh, what I came back with was Mariachi Plaza, which I see now is getting something like $30 million to make bike and pedestrian connections. Mm -hmm. There's housing investment there, source of pride and culture for the Hispanic community, literally Mariachi. Man, that that sort of thing with just a single transit station 
uh, because of a public investment as part of a network in a, an area that many people didn't either know about or wouldn't visit or had written off. Oil Heights shows you again the transformative possibilities of infrastructure, design, commitment, politics, money, people. Why we love cities, <laughs> indeed. And, you know, I want, the, the, you mentioned this this concept of utopia, and it's always the utopian question, and it is another murmuring oh, yeah, I hear around here. Uh, well, it depends on your kind of utopia, but let's say Vancouver is its own type of utopia. Yes. How do you keep the experience of being here from turning dull? Yeah, well, that's so overdone. Mm. If you can't have fun mm. or find a cultural outlet, dude, that's more your problem. Do you think that. the worries are completely baseless? No. Hmm. It's certainly possible to suffocate that. Hmm. And if you don't have a place, for instance, to make noise, hmm. to do your sculpture, if you can't afford it, if the regulations or the... But you're blaming everybody else hmm. for not taking on what the problem is that allows you that expression or joining with hmm. others to do it. Hmm. It's not as though there's a constituency, a lobby, a city hall that wants to crush this. Everybody talks Richard Florida. Mm. And the city has lots of examples, uh, commi current commitment to a new art gallery. Mm. Um, but the culture that really counts is the one that emerges because of all of the mixes and the possibilities of place and people. And you can't, you can't crush that. Mm. You can certainly try and regulate it. And to some degree, you've got to. Uh, mm. I'm quite familiar with the phenomenon of the idea of the 24-hour city and the mix of uses, mm -hmm. and I lived in it. Mm -hmm. So I quickly realized what the problem was. Mm -hmm. I have to get a good night's sleep. Ah, oh, yes. Weren't right. able to sleep there. Yeah, i got to be able to sleep. Right. And, it's, and I don't care what you are doing if you're telling everybody else who's actually made the commitment to the neighborhood mm -hmm. that, no, my ability to have a good time and party or play music or whatever it is supersedes your right to have a... Good night, sleep. No, 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 no. You're simply wrong. <laughs> I see. Yeah, no, it's that basic. You got yeah. human beings have to be able to sleep, Indeed. and that's just an absolute bottom line criteria. Mm. Now, how do you? So, how do you do it? How do you manage it so that people do have these other opportunities? Where is your entertainment district? You can manufacture one like uh, L.A. Live. Mm. All right, and it's clear to got a role. But there's all kinds of spontaneous things, and the moment we actually identify it and define it, well, it's probably in decline. Mm -hmm. so it's moved on. Yeah. Or it may be the consequence of crisis. Soho, of course, being, uh, um, gosh, it must be almost a textbook case, isn't it? Soho, as a consequence of Robert Moses' proposal for the Cross uh, Manhattan Expressway, basically sterilized the land values. People were just waiting to demolish, to be appropriated, and all of those lofts demolished. But what happened in the interim? Well... Illegally, artists moved in. But that's, you're going to try and uh, Richard Floridize that? Oh, Richard Floridize. You, know, you, you won't be able to because it was a consequence of those particular circumstances right. and almost a niche being filled by an opportunistic species. Mm. <laughs> yes. Who, by definition, you can't regulate because mm. then you've, what you've done is you've defined value. Mm. You said, okay, your tenure, your ability to be there and do something productive, whether it's artistic or economic, it has to be both, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody's going to get that value. And the higher the value, the more somebody's going to appropriate it. And everyone will be there trying to get it, illegally or illegally. Wow. Well, if you try and regulate that, and at some point you've got to, that crushes that spontaneity that comes because of illegal activity. Mm -hmm. The same is true, uh, interestingly, with sex. Mm -hmm. Or marijuana. We're going to go through the same thing. To a great degree, that which was surreptitious, illegal, has an increasing erotic power, and erotic in the broadest sense. Yes. It's exciting. It's baking, breaking the boundaries. It's, the, um, it's all the stuff that came out of uh, the 60s, right, that we associate with the outlaw. It's a great part of American mythology. Mm -hmm. But you can't have an outlaw society. Right? It just doesn't function from day to day. I've talked a lot or somewhat about surveying, right? And it's the same kind of with human behavior. There must be a certain amount of regulation for people to function in a civil society. And that's the reason we have, for instance, uh, the ability to register documents, to be able to fight your case fairly before an impartial court, for violence to be monopolized by the state through police forces. But it doesn't allow for the outlaw. And no one's going to write a law that says you can be outside its boundaries. No. So it, in a way, that's a very long way of getting around to the same question. Are we going to sterilize culture, opportunity? Are we going to make this place dull? 
Uh, I, I just wonder. Think that's the question. The fear is if it will get dull. I don't know if they fear that it will be made dull, but there's. I guess everybody worries. Is my home going to become dull by some way that I'm not foreseeing? And I want to know now. At this point, it has to get personal. Ah, uh, sure. You know, what's your definition of dull? Generally, what I find is associated with alcohol. Oh, is it? Yeah. Interesting. I mean, getting getting a working definition of what isn't dull is a fascinating exercise. True, but Vancouver, I only visit every year or two, so I, I find it. It's always fun to be here. Same with Portland. I visit every year or two, and it's always fun. It's a novelty to go to. I'll talk to people who live in those places or have lived for a while. They'll say, oh, I don't know. Maybe they're being modest. They say, well, you know, if you lived here, you'd you'd get bored sometimes. And, you know, I wonder if things are going to become dull. And that's what they'll say. I don't know if they mean alcohol, but maybe it's just the divide. It comes up a lot. I, I have fun in Vancouver, but I, I'm aware of the term no fun city. Yeah. I'll say that. Yeah, that's alcohol. It is. Yeah, I was, on, I was in council at the time, so I'm quite familiar with that I is, see. And that's all about alcohol. Interesting. License for alcohol, mm -hmm. right? Whether you have the license or somebody else has a license or whether you can get the license or where you can have the license for. Mm -hmm. eh, yeah, no, alcohol. And needless to say, because it works so effectively that you try and uh, predict any municipal election, no fun city. <laughs> the council that came in after us uh, opened it up. And before we know it, Granville Street turned into a place where stabbings every weekend were common and where the police had to go in and reestablish the limits to fun no, and where we had so many seats we've created. In fact, a very dull street because those bars at night, which are a lot of fun for at least a certain group of the population, mm -hmm. are dead in the day. So trying to address no fun city because it involved alcohol got very complicated and people, I think, oh, missed gosh. the point. Mm -hmm. Now... Let's take the example that I'm more familiar with, uh, the seawall, the great, greatest public space perhaps in Canada. So, you know, 26 miles, you could run a marathon on it. A few breaks, but mostly complete. Yeah, it's pretty dull if your sense of dullness is just unrelieved beauty. Dullness in the eye of the beholder. So much. And I wonder as well, you know, let's, based on, based on what you like about cities, what, what city do you think Vancouver can learn from now? Well, uh, any city. <laughs> any, any city. Literally, <laughs> literally look at any city and get a positive or negative example. That's the great thing about being on council. When I would go to other places, I could see that city through my own filter, as it were, and then I come back to my city and I see it through what I've learned elsewhere. Right. So if you can't go and learn from another city, man, you're just not looking hard enough. Indeed. Yeah. But, so let's get down to the details. We're a city of about 2 million, a region of about 2 million. That's a really nice size. It's not surprising when you go to these lists of most livable city or the Mercer list or whatever. It's, it's regions of about 2 million. So it's the Helsinki's and the Vienna's and the Auckland's and um, the Amsterdam's. Yeah, they're regions of about 2 million. They tend to be ports. They have a viable or government or something, you know, a solid economic foundation. Uh, they tend to be welcoming to immigrants. Uh, they invent themselves continually, but they're also highly regulated. Okay? Mm -hmm. And they have really good transportation systems. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, because my particular focus at this point in my life is on this question of transportation, because we screwed it up so badly by going to car dominance for most mm -hmm. of the 20th century, and the world's largest industries and millions of jobs, the planning visions of the people at the top, the decision makers, is still fundamentally around the car. Mm -hmm. That's one thing I learned pretty quickly as I, when I sat on the TransLink board and was one of the few who actually got to that board by transit, is decision makers, by and large, see the world through the windshield. Mm. Uh, to give one example from Jarrett Walker, he may have used it. Those kind of decision makers care about speed when it comes to transit. Mm. Transit users care about frequency. For the car driver, the car's always there. Frequency is not the issue. They just want to know whether the bus or the transit system will get them faster than they could otherwise drive. That's their simple criteria. But it's not what cities are really about. Again, it's this layering of choice, this mixing of uses, the way the multitude of transportation choices work for the individual and their ability to be able to access what they want, accessibility, not mobility, in a way that's affordable and safe and practical. It doesn't sound like it should be that difficult. Cities have to do it, but we, as North Americans in particular, and unfortunately set the standard for the world, thought it could all be done around the car. Hmm. Why, why did we think that? We oh, because you can imagine the appeal of the car. Right, that's not the car itself. Go but... interview John Norton. Uh, uh, mm. Peter Norton wrote a book called Fighting Traffic. Mm. Uh, just Google that, and you'll... Uh, finally, I think what he came across is really now being realized. Mm. Um, 
I'm trying to use the term motordom as well, which Peter captured. And it would have been a word common in the 1920s. And what it meant was this alliance of interests of the automobile clubs and early adopters, the dealerships and the manufacturers, and those who recognized we needed good roads for this. But more importantly, they had to deal with the social consequences of the car. And Los Angeles was a real battleground. You introduce a car driven independently by someone unfamiliar with basically how you move this piece of metal, and it resulted in the slaughter of thousands of children. In Cleveland, for instance, um, within about a two-week period, 13 children were killed. Can you imagine that today? What motordom really needed to do, and Norton documents how they did it, basically through public health programs, is find a way to allow the car to become a choice that would be allowed even though the consequences of it were horrendous for the streetcar system, for our urban form. It wasn't realized at the time. And they did it through both public health and through engineering. Uh, and by the time the 1920s were over, the car was emerging as a favored dominant mode for the middle class. And we started to design our cities to serve that. Parking bylaws. Show me your parking bylaw. And I can pretty much show you probably what kind of city you're going to get as a result. Donald Shoup has been on this show, so for listeners, check, check that one next. If you haven't heard it, you'll get a full experience here. Then there was the break, and Whit Aldrubchinsky makes this point. Um, and it's one of these things that you go, oh, yeah, of course. We had generations of community builders and architects and designers and engineers who knew how to build the fabric of the city from the early 1800s right through to the 1920s. And as the streetcar shaped the western city in particular, they learned how to build for that. So these streetcar suburbs, of which Los Angeles is basically a connected series. And it was beautiful stuff, and it worked really well. Eh, People had some problems with the streetcar companies, for sure. There's always downsides to these things, but no question from a real estate point of view, from creating the American dream and providing people with transportation choice that worked brilliantly. And then the Depression and the war. So nothing got built. And those who knew how to do it didn't pass it on. There was nothing to build. And so the intuitive understanding and the skills and even the parameters, the pro formas, the financial documents, all of what you needed to build complex cities was just kind of set aside. A void was created, and that void got filled by modernism. Carbusier, the road boys, the interstate freeway systems, the Bureau of Reclamation, infrastructure on a wartime scale by men in hierarchies given a single mandate to transform the environment for a greater good and as a result basically got to design our cities. Mm -hmm. They established through the criteria in order to move the automobile safely at high speed across regions on certain forms of infrastructure, that was the only thing that counted when it came to making decisions about how you build your cities. Mm -hmm. And we did. We did it so fast And so suddenly, we're still living with the consequences. We're trying to figure out now what to do with that public investment. And now, how do we go back to what would have been intuitively understood and skillfully crafted of an era now that no one experienced? Mm -hmm. Out of of living memory now. Yeah, so that's new urbanism, right? That's all the things we're, we're by and large, talking about. That's what in our, our program, the city program, in urban design and community sustainability, we try and teach But we, in a sense, have to all reinvent it, appropriate to our time. The car is clearly not going away. We do have this infrastructure. We do have new technologies, the high-speed electric elevator, reinforced concrete. We can build at a massive scale, new financial forms, new forms of government. And then these lovely little things that we have in our pocket, the computers we carry around with it, that were just at the early... This is a Model T of our time. He's holding up an iPhone, iPhone, by the way. I've got one as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, we don't we just? So new forms of communication that for another generation are changing their transportation choices. Where did this sudden thing happen that kids aren't driving? That they aren't getting their driver's license at 16 or 18 or whenever it is? How could this have happened? No one, if you had told them when I was on council... That the next generation coming up isn't going to care about driving anywhere like you do. That would not have been believable. And you certainly couldn't have said to the engineers and planners, start planning for that. Mm -hmm. Assume that the uh, capital requirements that you're going to ask us for, you won't need because there won't be as many people driving. That would not have passed the laugh test. Mm -hmm. 
wouldn't have been possible. As I said, the world's largest organizations, whether they be government or car companies or energy companies or road builders or the unions that are dependent on these jobs or, again, people aspiring to the North American way of life, you know, we're at the top of the food chain in their eyes. You've got to have a, your own automobile industry. Like the Chinese, you're going to commit yourself to 50,000 miles of effective interstate system. Mm. Hot, you know, you throw in high-speed rail, throw in light rail, all of those things go with it. But it's fundamentally dominated by the belief that the car simply must be the dominant mode and urban design will be secondary to it. Mm. As it drops out, there's a disbelief. And then it turns into something else. Frustration and then anger. And if you want to understand why bike routes, separated bike routes, unleash these forces of almost hatred, that's why. Because it's actually representing a change that is, first of all, not believed to be possible, that is questioning, if not undermining, the order of things, and may ultimately threaten your self-interest. If your job, if your wealth, if your power, if your convenience... So much of the opposition to bike routes comes down to four words. I am being inconvenienced. <laughs> That's not right. No. Look at Prospect Park West. How can you have these very powerful people, one of whom was actually a transportation commissioner, right, a United States senator living on Prospect Park West, so virulent, so angry, about, so determined to get rid of a separated bike route? What is underneath that? Well, not very far underneath it is that string that you pull that connects it to all of them, huge global issues of our time, whether you're talking about energy, climate change, obesity, urban form, social equity, income inequity. All of those issues are directly connected. Someone on a bicycle can easily be seen to be a threat. Throw in sex. If that's a young man, fit, aggressively cycling, battling their way, if they have to, through traffic, inconveniencing you, getting in your way, making a statement you don't want to hear, uh, to a great degree, that's where the anger comes from. I think it's dissipating, again, because of technology, bike share. If you've done Velib, or if you're going to be doing city bike in New York, or if you're going to do a Boris bike in London, if any city worthy of the name has to have a bike share system, yeah. and hence the infrastructure to go with it and generate another generation begins to take that for granted, that they see their identity as part of it. And they see that bike as being able to, as you can on Max in Portland, taken on to the Max system. And the card that you have, which is part of your identity, uh, the seamless card, right? The card that you have that you can load up, and all you have to do is swipe it, and it gives you access to all forms of transit. The main thing that it has done is to have done for transit what we did for the car, which is to make the trip, the next trip, seem to be free. That's why we hate tolls, why it's such a political non-starter for so many decision makers. Mm -hmm. To put a charge on the freeway, to charge somebody in a way where they actually perceive the cost on a per-trip basis, it violates something understood in our system of our way of life. Now, we do it have done it for transit. You had to pay each time you got on the bus or the train. Yeah. You had to take money out of your pocket. You knew what that cost was. Every time you wanted to take a trip, you had to think about, do I have the money? Yeah. Do I have a pass? You go through the process each time. The only time you have to do that for a car is when you fill your tank with gas. That's why the price of gas is such a political trigger point as well and why it hasn't been raised for so long, the tax for it. But what does a card do, a loaded card, a uh, oyster card, a uh, uh, the card that we're going to be introducing on our system, a U-Pass that you give to students at the beginning of their school year, and they can use as many times for all forms of transit, any time of day for all zones. It makes the next trip seem to be free. Right. We've done for transit what we've done for the car, and guess what? They started to utilize it. Mm. And then their identity became connected to it. Their map of the city became not just one of arterials and freeway interchanges, it became station stops and bus routes and corridors and how that links up and other modes and how far you have to walk and how time and distance shift when you start measuring things at 5 kilometers an hour, not at 50, when the distances that you want to get to are measured in station stops, when the people that you know have to live within a certain distance of transit, if that's your dominant mode, 
when the bicycle becomes an extension and the foot becomes an extension of the bicycle, when all of these things become seamless and integrated into something where you don't see the marginal cost, the mm-hmm. cost of the next unit, that's cultural change. Right, right, right. What gave you your, or cultivated in you your intellectual interest in cities? Was it from transit or was it from housing or was it from architecture or what, 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 was, the, what was the window you, you climbed through to, to get into your interest in cities? <laughs> Being gay. Really? That was it. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll put it this way. Um, I'm staying with a friend uh, right now. He and his partner live here in Vancouver and he, he emigrated to Canada because, and to urban Canada because those are two being gay is better if you're in Canada, and it's better if you're in an urban center. Well, it's not overly romanticized. It, is. Maybe it has a certain appeal. <laughs> and so in 1978, uh, as a young man coming out in the 70s, you can imagine, well, maybe <laughs> your listeners can't, many of them not being born. Um, but yeah, no, this was after Stonewall. Um, I have to say, though, there was never an incident like Stonewall or the bath raids in Toronto and Vancouver. Mm. It's a very accepting place. Um, but you could reinvent yourself. And I came from a relatively small city, Victoria, across the strait, mm. <laughs> ironically, <laughs> to Vancouver, where I could reinvent myself. But mm. really, what was the connection to the city? Well, I moved into the place that I thought I would hate. The, the, I moved into the West End, the place that, for my generation of Victorians, was the concrete jungle, what had ruined this pastoral environment which, where the developers had been allowed to run free, where they could put up the cheapest form of architecture and development, where mm-hmm. basically they were perfectly happy to ruin the city, pave it over. Uh, I had contempt for it. And yet this is where all the other gay guys were. Oh, yes. And so it was a good place to cluster. You could literally reinvent yourself because the people around you were doing the same thing. And because the neighborhood had been bulldozed and the social fabric that had made it up had vanished as well, this was fertile ground for that reinvention. And then you knew friends who said, come and visit me. They were living in the heart of the American city. So Castro or West Hollywood or the village. Well, they were all living in some form of village or another. And they all knew how to use transit. And they guided me through this. And they introduced me in those days. It did seem like you were dancing on the edge to the bars and the dance clubs at the time when certainly disco, but this whole sense of America um, going through this crisis, was almost a nervous breakdown. It was just incredibly culturally vital. And all these young men were going through the same thing. So I had to look at the city through new eyes. And boy, it was incredibly exciting. And design. So many of them were into design. So whether they were interior design, I mean, the cliche is true. The cliche is true, right? Whether they were architects or interior designers or landscape architects, that's a big one. (laughs) Oh, I can just see what that remark would have done to the landscape architects out there. Uh, I mean, this was a really amazing time because of the literature. The power broker, I can never... Never forgotten the experience of reading The New Yorkers um, published three uh, chapters from The Power Broker, the biography of Robert Moses. And so when I went to New York for the first time, I had this kind of background in my head, and I was being taken through this experience. Even just when the gay games were held in New York and uh, the triathlon was held out at Orchard Beach, I knew what Moses had done there and Mm -hmm. the experience of getting there and the, the built environment and the transformation of it. It was just... An incredibly absorbing learning exercise. And then, in addition to getting elected to being the second gay, out gay um, candidate uh, who got elected, a counselor who got elected in Canada, I could then meet others who were emerging at that time. And so, socially and culturally and physically and urbanistically, all of this transformative time, yeah, I mean, that's, that's living. That's life, right? That's life. And it was about cities. Right? And at this time, of course, every generation reacts to the circumstances in which it was raised. So we were leaving the suburbs happily. What our parents had searched out because they were leaving these overcrowded and dangerous and polluted environments and aspiring to a better way of life and all the technology that we associate with the post-war period, Mad Men. Yes, indeed. Right? We wanted to leave behind. And for gay men, they were pioneers of this, Mm -hmm. reinventing themselves and the neighborhoods and the cities. I could see at the time that it wasn't going to last. You couldn't live the lifestyle that a lot of gay men were living um, in the center of these cities. It was just burning candles 
Mm. Had many different ends. Didn't expect AIDS. Mm. But when it happened, uh, but at the same time, it's a manifestation of what happens when human beings live in these environments and go through these explosions of creativity. Mm. It's not always positive. There's going, it's life. There are going to be negatives. And yet that community responded. If anyone had told me at that time, back in the height of AIDS, when we were as concerned about quarantine as much as what this thing was, that within my own generation, I'd be married. That's got to me, in my mind, to be a reflection of the generative power of urban environments mm -hmm. that allow people choices. And if they are managed well, and this is the part you know we tend not to talk about when we're in the cultural mode, I understand the need for the infrastructure, for the capital that goes with it, of how the borrowing is done, of the taxes that support it, of the politics that is played against that. Watching the emergence of the right in the um, suburbs of Orange County, the initiative system of Proposition 13, of, of all of the things that happened to Oregon and uh, Washington with the consequence of trying to cut off government from sources of revenue and live on that incredible capital that the generation after the war built and that we are just drawing down because we never thought we would have to maintain it at the expense of continuing to build more capital, physical capital, whether it's light rail or high-speed rail or all the things we want to do. We now have to look at the consequences of maintaining the previous infrastructure, whether it be the water projects of California or the hydro lines of British Columbia, the road systems, the physical buildings, these 1960s high-rises that are still in good quality but dubious plumbing, of the constant maintenance, the constant amount of revenue that you're going to need and where that revenue comes from, and then you come up against the cruel, cruel irony of our time is that we have built an extraction machine based upon the natural capital of the planet for which we are beginning to reach some kind of limit. You know, again, a good debate about that. But anyone who's not beginning to think about what the strategic consequences of climate change are going to be, much less what we can see currently they're heading, because you're not going to be able to predict with accuracy the consequences of these complex systems, brings you back again, in my mind, to doing better with what you've already got. So a good definition of sustainability. Those dingbat apartment buildings, how can they constantly be rebuilt? How do the Japanese do it? You know, because of fire and earthquake, they constantly rebuild these, more or less the same urban form. And for affordability, you don't want to go in there and start bulldozing. God knows the upward pressure on rents and the value of those suites is going to be tough enough. But you go in and you want to completely rebuild all that? No, not a good idea. On the same time, you've got to accommodate growth. I mean, Hollywood is definitely dealing with this issue right at the moment. But even take, take Hollywood. When I first visited it uh, with the hookers just off um, between Santa Monica and Melrose, what was the street? I mean, this was back in the 60s. This is John Recchi period, if that rings any bell to you. You know, these were not comfortable or safe places. Yeah. This was like going through Times Square in New York. Mm -hmm. This was going down. At the same time, it was enticing and fascinating and sexual and mm -hmm. right erotic again. Boundaries. You could see boundaries were being crossed. Mm -hmm. Very exciting stuff. But to reinvent itself... Well, you can get into the same argument that you were raising before. Does you, do you basically take the life out of it? Do you turn it into Times Square Disneyland? Do you sterilize it? Do you take those elements? And my response is, but you got to be kidding. You're talking about organic human places with all of the elements that will constantly reinvent itself. If you're having a problem finding fun, really, that's more your problem. Anyway, it's probably your age, right? <laughs> so that's it. That's the age. Yeah, that's a good part of it. <laughs> and that's a whole other conversation, I suppose. I've been speaking here. <laughs> Wait a minute, we're just Price. getting going. <laughs> I know, I know. It's, it, 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 it's a shame, but uh, all, all things must come to an end. I've been speaking here with Gordon Price, director of the City Program at Simon Fraser University, former counselor of the city of Vancouver. Uh, he also puts out the electronic magazine uh, Price Tags. Gordon, thanks so much. Well, thanks for mentioning Price Tags. I do appreciate it because, you know, the blog must be fed. <laughs> Indeed. And it's just a wonderful way to communicate with others as well. So, sure, people, please Google Price Tags and send me stuff. Price Tags and send him an email. This has been Notebook on Cities and Culture. I've been Colin Marshall. You can keep up with the cultural creators, internationalists, and observers of the urban scene on the show at colinmarshall.org. Thanks. Thanks.
And special thanks to everybody who backed Season 3 on Kickstarter, including Paige Calvert, Jonathan Crow, Douglas Dollars, Paul Doyle, John French, Eric Graham, Will Graham, Umberto Grant, Kimberly Hahn, Carl Haley, Stefan Halperin, Matt Howie, Andrew Hovenick, Mark Hines, Andy Cooney, Mark Larson, Matthew Licky, Mr. Munvirzi, Rob Montz, Lindsay Muniak, Daniel Murphy, Aidan Nolman, Patrick O'Flaherty, Danny Olson, Michael O'Regan, Blake Riley, Rob Schultz, Cam Smith, Small Demons, Todd Shimoda, Kevin Smokler, Thomas Unterberger, Matt Warren, and Wayne Wright.